Do you remember the end of the world? No? No one in? No? Anyone remember the end of the world? There you go. In Paul's day, there was a bunch of them that thought the second coming had already happened. Maybe not quite the end of the world, but the beginning of the end of the world. I have a few memories along the way. In fact, more than I'm going to recollect with you today of people who have predicted the end of the world. There was the Adventist who's now at rest, who came up with a scheme of jubilees which led through to, if my memory, it's a bit hazy, but it might have been about 1998 when Christ was going to come. And then, of course, there was the whole Y2K thing, which was really interesting because not long before that, we were travelling in the States and they were prepared for Y2K, if ever you were, because you could go to, whether it was your local Christian bookshop or um, your local survivalist store, and they would sell you a Y2K pack. And depending on um, what you wanted to buy, it could be anything from um, dried food and tins and water, and of course, ammunition, being America, um, through to the deluxe pack, which included not only the ammunition, but the guns and everything else that you needed to survive Y2K. But it fizzled. Probably a good thing. There was, when I was probably about high school age, um, a guy that we, we went and listened to. And his whole thing was, and he, I don't know whether he was even from a Christian background, but he had these grand theories about the New World Order. Really interesting to listen to. Um, but it got a bunch of us um, going and looking for these buildings that were windowless buildings that the government had built to spy on us all. And so we, living in Adelaide at the time, I can remember driving in a bunch of us, mostly blokes, in cars, and sure enough, we found the building. Big, about three, could have been four-storey tall building, brick on all four sides, you know, big metal doors, not a window to be found in it. Had a sign on it, but it was just a front. It said Telstra Exchange. And then, of course, there were the Mayan um, calendar conspiracies that the world was going to end in 2012 because of this extrapolation from some Mayan calendar or something. And, well, there were certainly people that thought it might happen, and there were people that were living with heightened anxiety at the time, worrying that, well, what, what happens if this is it? Actually, it was an interesting thing, because if I go back to that, that trip we did into Adelaide to find the Telstra exchange, um, there was some in that group of friends of mine that got so caught up with theories about the end that in the process they lost sight of who they were waiting for, and when it didn't eventuate like they had come to believe it would, they found at the end of that they had no faith in Christ anymore. And that's kind of stuck in my head ever since because I think it's possible to get to a place where we are so focused and convinced on our schemes that somewhere in the process we lose sight of the Christ that we are looking forward to whose coming is the one that it's all about. When Paul writes 2 Thessalonians, it's probably only a matter of, of months. How many months? Don't know exactly. It's not years and years, I guess is the point. He's still in Corinth when he's writing it. So 1 Thess Thessalonians, I know it's a bit of a tongue twister, try saying that five times fast. Um, 1 Thessalonians is written and addresses a couple of key things about um, death 
and about the second coming of Christ. Somewhere in between 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, there is a bunch of people, um, call it fake prophecies if you like, fake news, there are people in the church that have either claim to have some other letter from Paul or that Paul has written some other letter or maybe they think they've got some interpretation on 1st Thessalonians or whatever it is and they have begun to convince people in the church there in Thessalonica, this baby beginning church, that Christ has already come and they are living in, in essence um, I, I guess somehow, and, and it's not clear because we're only getting the letter. And so we're trying to guess what's, or well not guess, it's an educated guess, but we're trying to unpick what's behind Paul's response to them. And it appears that some of these false teachers have, have got them to a place where they, they, they believe that somehow they're in the middle of the second coming. You know, Christ has come and so some of them have stopped working. Some of them are, as Paul calls them, idlers, just doing nothing. And there's others that are in this heightened state of shock and anxiety. And, and the words Paul uses in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2, this is really the heart of, of 2 Thessalonians, and I'm not putting anything up on the screen today because I want you to be able to see it in its context. So if you've got a, a Bible with you or a device, pull it out because I want you to look at this as we go through it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 1, Paul writes this. He writes, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you, he says. This is at the crux of, you know, the, the heart of 2 Thessalonians. As we, we said a couple of weeks ago, you cannot go more than 12 verses in 1 or 2 Thessalonians without reading about the second coming. It's front and centre. So he settled some things in his first letter, but now in his second letter, they've just, they've got a bit mixed up in their thinking, or some of them have again. And so there's these, these false reports that are stirring the people up, that are unsettling them, that are getting them into, the word he uses in my translation is a state of alarm, a heightened state of anxiety and fearfulness. Isn't it good we don't live in a climate today where we could be encouraged to end up in a heightened state of anxiety and fearfulness because of things that people might say? It's interesting, as we read Paul, I, I, the more I've read 2 Thessalonians and, and dug into it, the more I think this is a message for us. And, and it's this, this sense that Paul is calling us to walk this balancing act. That yes, we know that times will be tough. That's prophesied. But we also know there's, there's kind of these parallel tracks that walk us through to the coming of Christ. And on the one hand, you've got, you know, the picture in, in Matthew 24 where Jesus says, you know, people will be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up until the day that he comes. In that case, it's a reference to Noah, but he says that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So there is, on the one hand, for those who don't want to see it, this sense that things just go on and on and on, as it always has, up until Christ comes for those who don't want to see it. And then on the other hand, there's this sense that, look, we who are in Christ, as he says in 1 Thessalonians, live in the light, not in darkness, and therefore we should not be surprised by this event. Well, in 2 Thessalonians here, he, 
he draws us to this central issue that he is grappling with. Now, let me just back, back a little bit here and go back to chapter 1. In chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4, he says these words, we ought always to thank God for you. What are you doing if you're thanking God? You're praying, aren't you? We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. That's what he's commending them for. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. Ah, now we, we're getting that insight into the circumstances. Yet again, just as in 1 Thessalonians, they are dealing with not only the anxiety and the fear of what's going on in the church, but the persecution that also feeds this, this trouble that they, they are grappling with. So, new church, some from pagan backgrounds, most from pagan backgrounds, some out of Judaism, Paul and the Thessalonians, they obviously have this warm and loving and respectful relationship. Um, and now Paul is, is building up to what is the crux of the issue. But before he gets to that, he's now um, needing to talk about God's judgment. And it's interesting because sometimes we read of God's judgment in a way that just makes us feel a little bit fearful and uncertain. Listen to what Paul says. This is verse 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. All this, in other words, the persecution that's, that's being leveled against them, is evidence that God's judgment is right. All right? So people undergoing persecution and trials, judgment is good news for you. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. In other words, persecution, if you like, has a purifying impact on us. Not that we seek it, not that we want it, not that it's given by God. It's the state that we find comes from time to time living in a sinful world where people hate God and hate people that follow Him. Verse 6, God is just, says Paul. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. It's kind of this, this reassurance that, yes, you're facing troubles now or there's more troubles coming, but God's going to sort this out. God's going to pay back trouble to those who trouble you, he says. And verse 7, and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. I don't think it's accidental that Paul drops in this almighty picture of Jesus coming before he actually addresses the issue he wants to address. Because if Jesus coming is this almighty picture of coming with blazing fire then it hasn't happened yet. Verse 8, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power on the day He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marvelled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. What is it that makes the difference between standing comfortably on the day of judgment and not? It's what we have done in our life with the gospel. As you look at it here, let me go back to that. He says... Um, he will punish, this is verse 8, those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the criteria for safety or otherwise in the judgment. It's why we can sing songs like Blessed Assurance because if we've accepted the gospel and we have Jesus in our life, we can walk out of this place with assurance that we can face any judgment with confidence. And then he comes back 
to something he keeps coming back to time and time again. Verse 11, with this, this is chapter 1, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you. That our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he starts with prayer. He comes to judgment. He comes back to prayer. Now he's going to delve into this issue of the second coming and, and you know, these false teachers and the false beliefs, and he's going to build in a few things that will help us understand that it hasn't happened yet in his day, but it's a future event. And if he's going to follow the same pattern, he's going to come back to prayer again. Because remember, this is not a theological treatise. This is a letter written to his friends in the Lord who are facing incredible trials and persecution. And he wants to untangle their thinking to enable them to think clearly, to realize that they need to stand strong in the Lord, they can be safe in the Lord, and they need not be worried unnecessarily. So let's have a look at what he says. Chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. So whatever it is that's out there, Paul is saying it's not credible, it's not from us, don't believe it. And then he says, verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Two things. And your translation may translate those slightly differently. Um, it may have man of sin instead of man of lawlessness. Um, it may have you know, various words that it uses there, falling away, um, rebellion um, in, in verse 3. In the end, it's talking about the same thing. So let's just consider these two things. Rebellion, falling away. If you go back to the Greek, the, the Greek word we get directly out of that is apostasy. So before the coming of Christ, there will be a falling away in the church. There will be an apostasy in the church where people will walk away from the truth and the gospel and faith in Christ. It actually shouldn't surprise us that Paul talks about this apostasy because Jesus warned about it multiple times, Matthew 7, Matthew 24, he said, you know, and this is my paraphrase, beware, false prophets and false Christs will come. False prophets are just, you know, what is a prophet? A prophet is someone that either claims to speak on behalf of God or somebody that claims they can predict the future. So a false prophet is somebody that falsely claims to speak on behalf of God or falsely claims to predict the future. And so it's not that they have to stand up and say, you know, I, I am a prophet from God on high. It's just that they will falsely claim to speak on behalf of God or falsely claim to predict the future. Jesus predicted it. Paul warns about it multiple times. Not only here is it inferred in, in Thessalonians, but when he writes to Timothy several times, he warns him to protect the church against false prophets, false teachers. John, um, when he writes 1 John, actually even talks about how there are, there are antichrists in our midst now, um, in his day. And so what we see is that this, this apostasy, this falling away that Paul says has to happen before the coming of Christ is future to Paul's day. It hasn't happened yet, he says, and therefore Christ has not come. It's a future event. And by the way, you remember what I said? We're coming to that. 
In fact, let me read that now. Just skip down to verse 5. This is, this is, so in chapter 1 he says, you know, Jesus will come in blind, what, is it, what are the words he uses? In blazing fire with his powerful angels. Verse 5, by the time he gets to there, he's saying, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And it's actually interesting. Paul is incredibly gentle and diplomatic in, in what he says here because there are some identifications that he could have just come out and said, well, this is what I'm talking about, but he's happy to leave it a step or two short of the conclusion. Why? Because he's talked about this stuff with them before. And it's like he's, he's just giving them enough to remind them of what he's talking about and saying, don't you remember we talked about this? You should know this. And so this, this apostasy, this rebellion, this falling away that has to happen before the second coming of Christ, in terms of its characteristic, we see, you know, this is a church connected thing because it's religious in nature. If you have a falling away, a rebellion against God, a falling away from the faith, that's religion. And he says that's got to happen before the second coming. It's future from the day of Paul. And you could argue too, as we go wider in scripture, that it's actually a sign of the coming or the soon coming of the Lord as faith falls away. Jesus asked the question when he walked the earth, you know, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It's a picture that the closer we get to his return, the more that people will abandon faith. And then we come to this man of lawlessness or man of sin, and again, Paul doesn't go further in, in illustrating or identifying. He, he throws in a couple of things which we'll look at, but he just, it's back to the, well, I've told you about this stuff, folks. You should know this. I just want you to, I'm just reminding you. So, man of lawlessness is probably the better translation of it, but lawlessness, you know, I guess it's the definition of, of sin in one sense. Um, so, this man of lawlessness, this man of sin, Paul has already told them about it, and verse 4, which we haven't read yet, let's read that, um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, he will oppose, this is the man of lawlessness, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. That's a blasphemous approach seeking to step into the shoes of God. And it seems here that, that there is, as we read on in a moment, there is a sense in which this power is being held back. Let, let's read on and then we'll talk a little more about it. Um, so verse 5 we've read, I'm going to come to verse 6. And now you know what is holding him back, do we? Paul thinks they should. Now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, unveiled, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming." So he's back to that glorious, almighty picture of the second coming of Jesus. But he's told us a few things in the process. He uses the, the, the term, um, and I'm just trying to spot where it is, back at the end of verse 3, this man doomed to destruction or a son of destruction. And it's interesting, this term is only used in one other place in Scripture and it also happens to be used by the... Um, disciple that Jesus loved, John. And in that case, it is used with reference to Judas. Judas is the one, of course, who was the disciple who betrayed Jesus, who allowed Satan in to pursue his own ends at the expense of anything and anyone else. And there's something about this man of lawlessness, this son of destruction, that, that we can learn from Judas about. So just as Judas 
is the betrayer and allows Satan to work in him, so too this man of lawlessness. So this man of lawlessness opposes God. It claims God's right to receive worship. It's already existing as, and is at work in Paul's day, but Paul never goes further to name it other than saying that it is currently being held back. Now, maybe he sees it being held back by Rome because the persecuting of Christians in Thessalonians arose from the Jews. So maybe God is using Rome to hold back the power, but maybe also we need to think about what John writes in Revelation where he talks about four angels holding back four winds until God gives the instruction to let go and trouble comes. As we come into verse 9, it says, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan. So there's this symbiotic relationship between the devil and this man of lawlessness displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that they will be condemned, so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. You've got these two, this separating that's taking place. And again, it's a, sim, a similar picture to what we get in Revelation where the closer we get to the coming of Christ, the greater the separation between those who love Christ and those who do not. And it eventually arrives at this point where God withdraws his protecting influence on, on the earth, sends a powerful delusion, as Paul writes it, to, to, I guess, allow that complete polarization to happen, where there's only two camps left and Christ is ready to come. And so, as we look at this, we, we probably see multiple applications. We see Rome playing a part for a while in protecting Christians, but that doesn't last. And then Rome becomes the persecuting power. And then imperial Rome falls and the church rises and the church becomes the persecuting power. And this pattern seems to, to go on. And, and we, we get down to the end of time where those that think they are doing good are doing evil and it's just a mess. And what it simply comes down to is, well, it's those who have not believe the truth, have not loved the truth, but have delighted in wickedness that end up on the wrong side of things. It's why truth still matters. It's why the gospel is at the heart of this. And, and my, my sermon title was, what you hope for shapes what you live for. I hope for an eternity with Jesus in peace with as many people as possible. And because that's what I hope for, I want to start living that way now, living a life of peace in Christ, not a life of anxiety and, and shock, which Paul is describing as to what's happened with these people, where they're just in this constant state of agitation because of what they think has happened. And Paul's saying, whoa, I pray for you. And he says it time and time again. Paul calls us to put our hope in Jesus, to live today in the hope we hold because what we hope for shapes what we live for. And the hope we have in Jesus takes us beyond the Donald Trumps of the world and the COVID-19s and the vaccines and the politics and the laws and whatever it be. And I want to read you what Paul says down in chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17. <laughs> in verse 13, guess what he returns to? Prayer. But we always ought to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved. That's good news. Anyway, verse 16, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. That's 
living hope. That's living in expectation of what he has for us. I want to pick up one more angle on this in closing. In chapter 3, he begins the chapter with the words, finally. You know, I used to collect end-of-the-world predictions. I had a file on them, and I've still got some of them. But the further I've gone on, the less space I have for it, because it's already full, but the less time I want to dedicate to that sort of thing, because it's rubbish. When we, we live at these times, Paul keeps coming back. You know, chapter 3, verse 1, finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly. Today, I want to tell you just briefly that leading through COVID is hard work. And it's not, that's not a complaint that's just an honest reflection. Leading through COVID means there are some days you wake up and you think, what on earth do we do next? And there are some days where you get to a point where you're just bone weary. And everyone's had a sense of that in different ways. And the thing that I see in 2 Thessalonians is not only this sense that Paul's trying to lift us to something better and higher, but time and time again he's saying, we pray for you. I pray for you. I want to tell you, I pray for you as a church. But I want to echo Paul's request, we need your prayers too. We need to be praying for each other as we have never prayed for each other before because none of us know what tomorrow will bring. But we know that if we are secure in Christ, we have nothing to fear. And so let me finish with the words of, of Paul. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured, just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you and I from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Paul speaks to us today, just as surely as he spoke to those Thessalonians. And actually, the fascinating thing is, and I know I've gone over time, but this is, I promise you, this is where we finish. Where it be, would be easy to divide into camps of, you know, today we've got mask wearers in America anyway, not so much here, mask wearers versus non-mask wearers and that sort of thing. It'd be easy to divide into camps what Paul says down in verse 14, he says, if anyone does not obey our, this is chapter 3, does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him, do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. So there's a little bit of something going on there, but I want you to notice the next verse, verse 15, yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as a brother or sister. So he says, even if we get caught up in this stuff, don't treat them like some foreigner. They're still our brothers and sisters. We've still got a message. We've still got to come back and hang on to that hope. So may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Pray for one another.